So we're 16-28. We are now playing very interesting games. And let's continue the strategy of playing super aggressively with white and very solid chess with black. So let's see what the pool brings us. We're black against Krishna Somo. And let's go with the Karokan, as we have yesterday. Thank you, Timber, gifting to Zathar. So d5. And he takes d5. Okay, so he plays some sort of a weird exchange Karo. Generally, knight f3 is a little bit inflexible. Let's see what he does. Probably d4. Yeah. Okay, so this is an exchange Karokan. There's nothing particularly... Um, there's not much going on here. Uh, Black simply develops the pieces. The one thing to understand is that this bishop on c8 uh, often doesn't have a good home. So it, it, it's worthwhile to develop this bishop either immediately to g4 or to start with knight c6 and then play bishop g4. So knight c6, so that's a bit of a limited mentality, I think. Lucky speedruns. So c3, which is fine. And again, we can go bishop g4, we can go knight f6, we can develop in any order that we want to. The one, whoops knocked my mic out the one um drawback of going bishop g4 in this particular position is that he has this queen b3 move to hit the b7 pawn so i'll violate the rule that i just said let's start by developing the knight and see what he does bishop b5 okay again that's not a very common way of playing it's certainly not bad i mean it's totally fine for white uh, but we're very comfortable as black here. So we should develop the bishop on c8. Bishop to d7 is very sensible on pinning ourselves. That's totally fine. But uh, bishop g4 is also totally fine. We're not afraid of this pin. The pawn is defending the knight. He can't really pile up on this knight. And the only way he would be able to is knight e5. So let's, let's go bishop g4. Queen to d3. That's a pretty good move. Um, it does unpin the knight. And so in the Karo Khan, in the exchange Karo, you often want to give this bishop away for the knight, and then you can develop very peacefully without having to worry that the bishop is going to be caught behind the pawn chain. So that's what we're going to do. Bishop takes f3. It seems a little bit odd to go bishop g4 takes f3, but that is one of the proper ways of playing these structures. You want to eliminate the piece that's going to get caught under uh, or behind the pawns. Queen a4, yeah, queen a4 I'll talk about afterward. So where do we want this bishop? We can go bishop b7, we can go bishop d6. Either move is okay. Um, they both have a strength and a drawback. Bishop d6 is more active, but it allows what move? Bishop d6 is more active, but it allows a little bit of an unpleasant response in tempo with a 5. Thank you. It allows bishop g5. That could be a bit of a nasty pin. And bishop e7 is slightly more passive, but it takes the sting out of bishop g5. So it, you could weigh the two um, and compare them. What you could also do is play the move h6 to stop bishop g5 and then try to go bishop d6. Oh, not king d6, bishop d6. So yeah, we can do that h6. I, I don't like delaying the development of the bishop for too long, but given that our position is as solid as it is, this is totally fine. Bishop d6. Yeah, the guy is playing very, very well. He's developing nicely. So the position is about equal. He takes, we take. Taking on c6 was not necessary on his on his part. And uh, we should probably castle. But if we're really, if we, if we delve down into the finesse here, this knight on b3, you guys should notice that it's eventually going to access the outpost on c5 and it's going to do that under the condition that the bishops are traded so if you look positionally white wants to go bishop f4 and offer a trade of bishops and in the event of a trade this knight on b3 is going to have access to that outpost so what move comes to mind to perhaps prevent the bishop from coming to f4 it's a typical karakan move and we should start with it because it's a healthy move on its own and it prevents bishop f4 so this bishop doesn't have a good developing square E arms, thank you, and D Zhang, thank you as well. There is, however, a drawback. And this is a bit hard to see. The moment you played Queen C7, I'm noticing that the knight is a little bit loose. This pawn on G7 is kind of overloaded. So if we were to nonchalantly castle, 
we would allow the very thematic sacrifice bishop not a sacrifice tactic bishop takes h6 it's a classic overloading capture so we should delay castling and uh, play one of several moves how can we improve our position to prevent bishop takes h6 it's a pretty um let's see king e7 is a little bit extreme <laughs> Knight e4. Knight e4 is what I was looking for. Put the knight on our own outpost. But some of you have also been proposing a very sensible a5 with the idea of a4 trying to chase the knight away. And if the knight goes to c5 when the bishop is still here, then of course we simply take. I quite like the move a5. I think that's a very nice positional move. Now, he can simply play a4. What does black gain if he plays a4? And this is a, like a conceptual thing. Okay, so he does go knight c5. In which case, we very happily take, ruining his pawn structure. And still, we shouldn't castle because of bishop h6. Now is the time to go knight e4. Now is the time to go knight e4. You would push c5. Yeah, c5 is a, is a sensible move, although it opens up the position and we're not castled yet. That's what I was a little concerned about. Now, of course, um, we can go f5 to support the knight. He might want to sacrifice the exchange. I'm not too concerned about it. So I would say let's just castle first. Against another GM, I might go f5 to prevent the exchange. So I don't see him sacrificing though, so we can castle. That's fine. Okay, so we've got a great position. We now want to go f5. We have the b file. Uh, and if he remains on c1, then we can tie him down. He goes b4. Okay. Now, do we want to take on b4 is the first question. Yes or no? Why or why not? Should we take knight c5? Yeah, I actually missed that we could, but it's it's not worth it. I think castling was still pretty good. Baz does, thank you. We don't want to take because that leaves his pawn structure, that corrects his pawn structure. It does open the a file, so there's a case to be made there. But frankly, he's not threatening to take on a5, so we should maintain that as it is. We have the move queen e5, that's interesting. We also have the move rook f to b8, also interesting. But let's begin by cementing this knight with the move f5. Let's begin with the most flexible move and then see where what he does. Yeah, I am. Okay. Queen h5. All right. So obviously... Um, He's, yeah, this guy's very good. Queen h5, um, one sec, queen h5. What is he, sort of, what is he doing? I don't really see a threat. Actually, I do kind of see a threat. He, eh, maybe bishop h6, but now nah, that's not serious. So the first thing that occurs to me when he plays queen h5 is that he's, he's moving his queen away from the c3 pawn. And if we take the pawn immediately, then he takes on e6 with very complicated position. So while we can't take the pawn immediately, there is a move which we could have played previously that I think now becomes a very strong move to pile up on this pawn with another piece. And that move is of course queen e5. I'm gonna play it a little bit quicker because we're down on the clock. Thank you, Jakey boy, I appreciate it. Um, I have a books command. All right. It also pins the pawn to the rook. So if he goes f3, which he does, we can play the very simple. Oh, there is knight takes g3. That's a cool move. But I was honestly thinking about queen takes c3. Just taking on c3, attacking both of his rooks. Let's see what he does. Okay. So he does have, oh wow, he saw it, oh my god. I did not expect him to see this move, uh, frankly. Because this is a counter attack on, uh, he's sort of defending his rooks and counter striking. Okay, let me think for a second. This guy's a lot better than I thought. So rook, yeah, rook f6 is what I'm leaning toward. Rook f6, bishop e3. Yeah, I kind of underestimated this move, honestly. We can also just take. Yeah, yeah, we should just take. Let's just take it. 
Queen g6 is extremely strong. We have to go back. He takes. We go here. We're going to get an endgame. And I think that endgame is better for black still. But, yeah, we take everything. He takes. We take. We still have a very, very strong pawn chain. But it's not going to be easy to win this. Well, until that move. Because he just blunders another pawn. No, his position collapses here. I think I found uh, the best... The best sequence there. Yeah, I mean, I saw bishop h6 out of the corner of my eye, but I didn't think it was as strong as it is. Yeah, now we're winning because we've got this pawn chain. He goes rook b3. He's definitely very, very underrated. Um, now, if we go rook b7, yeah, let's go rook b7 to defend the pawn. And if he goes a3... We can't take on a3, but what we can realize is that he's not threatening to take on b4. That's the key insight. He's not threatening to take on b4. So we can simply make a move that we would make otherwise. So this pawn on c5 is an isolated pawn. I'm looking at it. I'm saying, well, how can I attack this pawn? There's two ways. We can go rook a5 or rook b5. Both moves look pretty good to me. Uh, rook b5 has the advantage of putting the rook on a defended square. So I would go rook b5. King a f2. That's actually very, very strong as well. Uh, let's just take here, though. No, it's not as strong as I thought. Positive vibrations, thank you. We just take on a3, force the trade, and then take another pawn. This is actually, we, we could go d4, but let's just take. Yeah, no, he's very, very good. This guy, very good. So let's let's go here. Let's start pushing our pawns. Let's start pushing our pawns. Okay, let's check him, and then push again. Push. We're basically just pushing it up. Push it up. Yeah, d4. This is very simple. Rook c2. Paving the way for e2. Yeah, but after the game, because I'm, I'm low on time. So, I'm sorry not to explain these moves. e2. Threatening to promote. I mean, here, very, very simple. Just d3. Push him, baby. That's right. Yeah, he finds, I mean, he is super resilient. So here, one trick that you can do. Well, first of all, let's push the c4 pawn. There's no rush. There is zero rush. Um, we can even push it to c3, but we should bring our king up just to make sure. Okay, now... Well, yeah, let's just take... Yeah. Yeah, we're going to have to basically win it the long way. It's not so simple to even push the pawns here. He's finding a way to, like, hold everything down amazingly. So one plan of, of winning this is just to get the king around to c3. That's what we're doing here. He's got to go back. Here. Here. You get the king to c3 and prepare move d2. If we want to be extra fancy, if you want to be extra fancy, we can sacrifice two of our pawns um, and transition into a winning king and pawn endgame. Does anybody see this tactic? What am I talking about here? You can sacrifice two of your pawns and force the trade of rooks. That's absolutely not mandatory, but it is possible. Nice. Some of you are seeing it. You can go e1. You promote to a queen, forcing the rook to be on the same file as the king. And now, um, rookie two check. Take it. King c3, king b2, rolling out the red carpet. So here, you could go king b3. You could go king d3, but he wants to get to c1. So the move is king b2. Now the carpet, the red carpet has been rolled out. c3. We can simply go c2 and c1 queen in this way.
All right, we're good. Sorry for the free moves at the end. Okay. So, yeah, that was a very, uh, very difficult game, I have to say. Let's check. No, but that's not too difficult. You just, once you made like 80,000 times, it becomes easy. <laughs> yeah, no, that was good, good accuracy, okay. So let's analyze this and we're, we're gonna call it because I'm, I'm like running out of gas. All right. So basically the, the game started and like knight f3 takes stakes d4 is pretty inflexible. If he wants to play an exchange, Caro, you should start with d4. And then the most clinical way of playing this is bishop to d3. This is uh, what is considered to be the most accurate move order because because you are preventing the bishop from coming to f5 and coming to g4. The, one of the, the points of the exchange car is to force this bishop to remain on c8. Um, so for example, after knight c6, you don't play knight f3. That's a positional mistake, right? You play c3, again, delaying the development of the knight. If knight f6, then you first develop this bishop. So you're developing all of the pieces in order to make it as hard as possible for black to get this bishop out. Now black can still go bishop g4, but now white has this move queen b3, and things start getting a little bit nasty with this pawn being hanging. And uh, this bishop is just sort of neither here nor there. It's like, you know, staring into space, so it can be easily chased away. To, I hope that makes sense. So that's considered to be the, the best way of playing the exchange Karo, which is one of the best weapons against the Karokan. By playing knight f3 first, he's allowing us uh, easy access to either of these squares. Okay, so we go knight f6, bishop b5, and bishop g4. Now, Sky, you asked about queen a4. And the funny thing is, queen a4 is quite a good move, actually. Because the, the thing is, if we go queen c7, white has uh, knight e5 when things legitimately get quite scary. Everything... I mean, three pieces are attacking c6. You should probably go bishop back to d7. Now white can bring the bishop out to f4. It's clearly an initiative for white. Probably not bad for black, but it's unpleasant. Now, what I was planning to do here is a very advanced idea. An idea that appears to be a blunder. Bishop takes f3. Why does this appear to be a blunder? I'm going to make it a little bit... Um, one moment. I'll be right back. Wait, where is the game? Oh, there it is. Bishop takes f3. Now, why does this look like a blunder? Who can tell me? What does white have in this position that seems to win at least a pawn and maybe even the game? Well, not g takes f3, obviously. Bishop takes c6. Queen takes c6. And we're busted. Because if queen d7, we drop the rook. And we have to play this terrible looking move. Knight d7. But... It's all an illusion. It's all an illusion. Whoops, Ugh, sorry, I keep promoting the wrong line. It's all an illusion. And after e6, I claim that black is not worse here, at least from a practical standpoint. This is a hard concept to understand for a lot of players because optically the position may look bad for black. You're down upon, white seems more active, but it's kind of pseudo activity. If you, if you look at it more carefully, you'll notice first of all that white is not developed. The illusion of activity comes merely from the queen being far advanced, but that's not a good thing. You'll chase it away with rook c8. That's just not uh, a big deal at all. And then yesterday we talked about static versus dynamic factors. Static factors are things that are unlikely to change. Static weaknesses, for example. And white has one very major static defect in his position that constitutes most of black's compensation. What, what am I talking about? It's, what is wrong with white's position here? It's, it's the, the ruined kingside pawn structure because the pawn structure itself is an issue. Black has very easy access to the F3 pawn, but more of an issue is the fact that white essentially can never castle kingside. White's king is a huge problem. Now you might say, well, it's not such a big issue, right? White can castle queenside, but that's also very subpar because white has advanced a bunch of his queenside pawns. So castling queenside is not going to solve any of white's problems either. This knight on d7, you can think about it coming out to c4. 
Black's got the semi-open B file. So Black's got the weapons to attack the queen side already at the ready. So it's just Black's got a lot of act activity here. And, it, and it's all contingent on Black completing his development, which he's going to do. You know, for example, you know, let's say bishop e3 or something, rook c8. You could even sack the a7 pawn. I don't give a damn about that pawn. Bishop d6, knight d2 castles, and white's king is in trouble. Because if castles this way, well, you've got this. Knight b6 is very strong. I think people get the point. It's hard to evaluate um, these types of positions, but it's important not to fall into this illusion uh, when a queen is active, that the position is bad. The queen alone is rarely uh, something that you can't deal with. And black doesn't have any targets. Uh, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's what I plan to do. Now, obviously, if white doesn't take on, F on c6, then you could play queen c7, you could play queen b6, rook c8. Well, rook c8 might be inaccurate, but even queen d7 is fine. Um... Okay, when you give up the A pawn, are you not afraid of the two pass pawns? No, because, oh, you mean here? No, because I think I'm gonna checkmate white long before these two pass pawns make their presence felt. Of course, in the long run, if white consolidates, I'm going to pay the price for this, but I just intuitively feel that black's attack is, is so strong here that these pawns are not gonna get very far, if, if that makes sense. If, is bishop g5 scary? It's a little bit unpleasant, uh, because if you take on g5, you drop the rook. That's the whole idea. You also can't play f6. Well, never play f6. And bishop e7 doesn't really help because of bishop takes e7. But I think you do have queen b8, first of all. Although that's not ideal. And perhaps you can play bishop e7 and simply take with a king. And then you can castle by hand. Rook e8, king f8. Not great, but better than nothing. And it preserves the, the general landscape of the position so yeah bishop g5 is i think white's best move okay so in any case that was an opportunity my, our opponent had he went queen d3 so we take this opportunity to get rid of the knight otherwise knight e5 is super annoying takes takes well sprintly is the, the g file is not dangerous and uh it's it's important not to overestimate the role of these files because you simply go g6 and the rook is biting on granite my favorite term when you've got a situation like this even if you put your king on g7 this is a tremendously solid pawn in order to break down this defense white's going to have to pile up on this pawn with this one and still that's not going to be enough the open files themselves are not always guaranteed you know they don't always guarantee that you're going to have a strong attack also no dark sword bishop to occupy the dark squares weakened by the move g6, which makes this possible to play. The king is very, very safe on, on the g-file here. Queen d3 takes, takes e6. Okay, that's good. We've got a solid equal position here, but our opponent has handled the opening quite well. Okay. So castles, h6. We, um, yeah, again, bishop d6 is possible. I didn't want to allow bishop g5. Had we allowed this, I would have played h6 anyway. And after bishop takes f6, we would take with the queen. And this pawn structure is nothing to worry about given that it's an endgame, but it is an opposite colored bishop endgame. That's more of the reason I didn't want to go for this. I was a little bit worried about the trage tendencies. No, ca usually castle in the carl. No, I would keep my king in the center. Um, if, if I were to do this, I would keep my king in the center because it's an endgame. I would play king e7 or king d7. And I would perhaps put a rook on g8. And if you think about it, in contrast, the queens are off the board, so it seems ludicrous to talk about an attack. But in contrast to the position we saw previously, here the g-pawn is not as safe as it was uh, in, in the other example, where black was the one of the pawn on g Because here we have a dark sword bishop, and we have two pawns that can be uh, repurposed as battering rams in order to break down this pawn on g3, although it's still tremendously robust. But I would keep my king in the center to answer your question. Okay. So we also could have played bishop e7, but that gives him easy access to the f4 square. Um, yeah, it can be worth going for the minority attack there for sure. So we play h6, knight d2, bishop d6. 
this was uncalled for. I don't know why he took on c6. I, I mean, I guess this was his idea. He was trying to organize, um, you know, he was eventually trying to occupy this outpost, but it's just not a very effective plan. He's, he's not going to get this bishop away from d6. You want to castle short in these positions generally. Castling long would be way too risky. So what would I do with white? I mean, there's, you know, black's position is very comfortable, but maybe drop the bishop back to d3 to get better control of the e4 square. And now one very typical plan in such positions is to go rook e1 and then knight f1 and knight g3, kind of like the Ray Lopez plan, accumulating pieces on the king side. Black is very, very solid. Black also has e5 in these kinds of positions, which gets an IQP position where black is very, very active. So generally he's got enough activity to compensate for the weakness of the pawn. But um, that would be one example of how things could have unfolded here. It's just equal. So he takes, he goes knight b3. Now this pawn is not a big deal because white is just not going to be able to attack it. Everything that you consider to be a weakness, you have to ask yourself the question, is it realistic to assume that my opponent will be able to attack that weakness? The answer here is no, white has no light squared bishop. How is white even hypothetically going to pile up on the c-pawn? It's just not something to worry about here. Okay. Weakness versus exploitable weakness. It's very, very important to, you know, to, to hold those two things separately in your mind. Something can be a weakness, technically, but be completely unexploitable, such as a square or such as a, um, such as a pawn. And whether a weakness is exploitable or not is far more important than, than sort of bogging yourself down to the semantics of whether something actually is a weakness. Thank you, Sky, for the... Uh, uh, extending this up. I have a good example on that. I always show this example. I've, I've shown this example more than once on stream because it's so instructive. And it's a great example of sort of inaccess. I, I wrote an article many years ago on chess.com where I called this inaccessibility. And I was talking mostly about weak squares where like players often hesitate to weaken squares because they look very bad. But if a piece cannot get to a weak square, then you should feel free to do it. Uh, then you, should, you shouldn't hesitate to weaken that square because everything in chess is very concrete. And so this is one of my favorite examples on the topic. And then I'll show you one of my games where I did something similar and learned from this example. So, so this is from 2013. This is a uh, battle between two super GMs, Sargisian and Tomaszewski. White is almost a super GM. This is the key position which occurred in their game. Um, it's pretty clear that White's got a minority attack going. Well, not even a minority attack, just a queenside attack going. And so the, the, the most tempting move is, is, is b5 here. But uh, Tomaszewski had prepared, after ABAB, a counter strike. What is this counter strike? Um. And where does it come from? Good night, it's really nice. What, what was uh, Tomaszewski planning? He was planning e5. Now this pawn on e3 is a backward pawn, and right now it's inaccessible. But e5 would make it accessible by opening up the e-file. So for example, after d e knight e5, right? This pawn is now on a semi-open file, which is occupied by black's rook, and this knight can then jump to c4 when this pawn becomes a very much exploitable weakness. So this is a very unpleasant turn of events for white. And so Tomaszewski or Sargisian was thinking here like, well, can I do something about the threat of e5? e5 is a very serious positional threat. So what comes to mind? And this is a move which seems tremendously anti-positional for many re for two chief reasons and the move is f4. I think this is a brilliant move precisely because it seems to violate so many positional rules. The first thing is it creates a massive gaping hole on e4. So you're immediately thinking of a nightmare scenario where the knight appears on e4. Black would basically be winning with such a knight on e4. But obviously the catch is that the knight can never get to e4. g5 is covered, d6 is covered. So the two entry points are both covered very reliably by white's pawns. The knight can get there, but it will take black eight moves. One, two, three, then the king will have to move. 
this is really funny, four, seven moves, five, six, and on the sixth move, by the way, white can go bishop h4 and pin the knight to the rook, seven, and seven moves in chess is a complete eternity. White, on the other hand, is one move away from going b5 and crashing through on the queen side. Now, the other reason that f4 might seem like an anti-positional move is because it blocks in the bishop. This bishop on g3 now seems totally, um, totally dead. But Sargassian realized that when he plays b5, he will have a chance to activate this bishop via e1, e1 and a5. And the activity of the bishop is not particularly important right now because the knight is equally inactive. It's like this move is equally bad to both minor pieces, but white's heavy pieces are better than their counterparts. So by taking the minor pieces out of commission for the time being, white allows himself uh, to attack on the queen side. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. I think you get the point. Um, can black break with g5? Well, that's what he did. Eventually, black did break with g5. And, and the game was very complicated. Like, white is not winning here. Very, very far from it. But white is better. And this was one of the reasons why he ultimately did win the game. I don't really want to analyze the rest. Black eventually did break through with g5. He had chances to draw. But white won in the end. You can look at this. You can search this game up online also. Now, I've also had uh, examples where I do something kind of similar on a much much more basic level. So one example where I did something that I was kind of proud of, although it was very, very, I was already winning and just wasn't a big deal at all. Um, but I was nonetheless pretty happy with the decision that I made. So, so this was an old game from 2008. I was playing white and my opponent was you know, I actually took some lessons from him and I was just starting to play. Really nice guy, Russian. Class, sort of classic Russian 2000. And in this position he played, I mean, white is better here, clearly. White's got peace domination in the center. He played g5. It's kind of a creative move. And his idea is that he's, this is a, car, a method of carving out. I call this carving out. You're carving out a square for one of your pieces. Now, what square is he trying to carve out with this move? C A R V E carve. What is he trying to carve out? Not the G6 square, the E5 square. Yes, the E5 square is what black is trying to ultimately uh, gain for his pieces. So from that perspective, I hesitated before playing F5 because I thought, well, this is a big deal. This is a pretty important square. Then I thought, no, it's not. My knight is simply defending that square. So what are the odds that he eliminates the knight and then gets his knight over to e5. They're very, very low. But uh, what does f5 accomplish? It makes both of his bishops look, inc look incredibly dumb. In fact, it completely paralyzes his position. And after rook e8, h4, the game is over. Because this bishop is undefended, I win this pawn. Black's position simply collapses here. So I didn't hesitate before playing f5. Or I hesitated for a little bit, but then realized that my worries were completely unfounded. Now... Where does this lack of hesitation come from? Final detour before we come back to the uh, speedrun game. There was a very famous game between Fischer and Enzicker where Bobby did something very, very similar. And that is the game I took my inspiration from. Literally, like move for move. Bobby did something very, very similar. Although the position was far more combative. This is a very famous game. It's also in one of my articles. So... In this position, it's an exchange Ray Lopez. Black seems to be very, very solid here. Very solid. I mean, two bishops. Solid central control. Bobby's got some nice pawns in the center. What do you think Fisher played in this position? This is a very instructive idea. I mean, you already can just, without even understanding the move, tell me because this is exactly the same move that I just played. So Fisher plays... I want somebody to find it. F5. F5 is, I mean, very clearly it locks the bishop in. It creates an outpost for the knight. But the key drawback is that it weakens the e5 square. And this seems to be a very important square that black can now occupy. But that's kind of an illusion because after queen e7, what piece can occupy this square? Well, the bishop. 
Bobby simply goes bishop f4, trading off the dark squared bishops. And after the trade, nothing will be able to remain on e5 for very long because the knight will eventually drop back to f3 and chase away either the queen or the rook. So the fact that this square is a serious weakness is a complete illusion. In fact, not only is it not a weakness, but Bobby uses that square and breaks through on it with e5 and rook e4, eventually winning a very instructive game. So this concept of weak squares, as you become stronger, you realize that sometimes you should weaken a square. And sometimes a square being inaccessible for one reason or another is a good reason uh, to allow its, its, its weakening. So that's, that's the bottom line. Okay, so back to the game. We go queen c7, sorry for the long detour. Queen c7, stopping bishop f4, g3, and now a5, preparing to chase the knight, drive the knight away from b3. Now, in this position, he could have played a4 and prevented the prog further progress of the a pawn, but that would have left the knight very much undefended. So now rook b8 comes to mind, or you can castle first and then go rook b8, but the knight is extremely loose here. So our opponent played knight c5, we take it, drop the knight onto e4. Uh, rookie one castles and now b4 i think b4 is a further mistake i think that bishop b3 preserves a reasonable position for white although white is definitely worse here you can play rook b8 and then double on the b file and start targeting white's weaknesses but knight c5 creates uh, pawn weaknesses on the queen side and there was no need to do that i think what you know our opponent should have probably just went here and dropped the knight back and black is maybe a tiny bit better but nothing major so I think knight c5 was a little bit of panic. Okay, so castles b4, f5, cementing the knight on e4. Queen h5, and now queen e5. So again, knight c3 allows rook takes e6, and if you just take the pawn on b4 thinking, ah, I'm a pawn up, well, now the bishop h6 is very, very strong because all of a sudden white's accumulated all these pieces on the king side. Why, why calculate this? There's absolutely no need to go for that. Yeah, so I blundered, to be honest, the possibility of taking on c5. I just missed that. And in retrospect, yeah, we should have just taken this pawn, I think. But after bishop f4, this does give white some activity for his pieces. And that knight on e4 is pretty damn good. One thing that could happen is if you're not careful, you could allow this bishop to hop onto d6. And then you can't castle at all. And because you don't have a dark squared bishop, these situations can be very, very unpleasant. So knight c5 is probably correct from a computer standpoint. And then probably we should go either queen e7 or queen d7 to not allow bishop comes to d6, and then we castle. Okay, so castles b4, f5, and queen e5. This is a key move. Attacking the pawn directly and centralizing the queen. Now he finds a very strong move, bishop h6, but I was proud of the decision that I made here. I think gh is a very important move that gives black a near decisive advantage in the end game. Now, oh, nice, this guy, that's nice. So why, like, what is the purpose behind bishop h6? Well, this is a pretty obvious move, actually, because both rooks are hanging. The only way to defend both of them is to move the bishop and also note that the knight is hanging. So if you just move the bishop to e3, then the knight's gonna drop back to f6 and black's going to be totally fine. So this is like a desperado sacrifice knowing that the knight on e4 is hanging. All right, why didn't he defend the pawn to bishop b2? So if you, go, if you want bishop b2 here, we take on b4. The bishop is undefended, so cb is not possible. This is completely devastating. Okay. So f3, queen c3, bishop h6, takes. Now he played, oops, sorry. Now he played a very um, strong move, queen g6 check. That's important. And um, why is that move important? Because if he would have taken his, uh, our knight immediately, and then, for example, just taken h6, he would have passed us the move. And we would have used this move just to drop the queen back to f6, for example. So this is a nice subtlety that allows him to take the e6 pawn with check. But the thing is, after king h8, we allow queen takes h6 check. That's unthinkable. So we go queen g7, and now we go queen f7, forcing the trade of queens. He can't not trade queens because then he lets the knight escape. The reason the queen trade is very good is because we now get this massive pawn chain 
which I think is essentially the reason why the endgame is winning. This pawn chain is just devastating because two of these pawns are passed pawns. These are connected passed pawns, and I think they essentially decide the game in our favor even though material is equal, if that makes sense. So he goes rookie three, which technically is a mistake, just gives up another pawn, which is wasn't necessary, but there was nothing that he could have done. If he plays a three, the simplest thing to do is to trade everything, and probably just to push the pawn. You could also go rook b7 if you're worried about some sort of a pawn breakthrough. This is all completely winning. Also important is the fact that the rook cuts off the king. Uh, yes, yeah, so we had a question after bishop h6. If we go knight f6, we allow queen g6, and that's a key move. Pinning the pawn to the king. I saw what you were thinking there, but it doesn't work. Um, so at fee, rook e3, a b4. Yeah, it's Roy Lopez, but I don't know why people are, like, obsessing over that pronunciation. I usually, I mean, in Russian, you say Spanish game. Like, you don't say Roy Lopez. Roy Lopez, you say Spanish game, but I, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> Yeah, it's Rui Lopez, or it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a Roy Lopez or Rui Lopez. It should be Rui Lopez. Roy Lopez, I don't know. I think, it, yeah. yeah, either way is fine. I think people understand what's meant. Okay, so A3, Rook B5, Roy Lopez. King F2 takes, and this is completely winning. This is very, very easy. Okay, guys, back to the game. It doesn't matter. Back to the game. Um, at this point, we're up two pawns and the game is over. So the only important move here was rook b5. Rook b5 um, is important because it attacks the c5 pawn. We cannot take on a3 because of rook takes b7. So we bring the rook to a defended square, understanding that he cannot take on b4 because his own rook is also pinned. And so now the game is, is totally... Did queen check on d4 do anything? At what point? Like at the point where, at this point, yeah, queen d4, the problem is he drops the bishop to e3, and now both the queen and the knight are hanging. So I thought about it, but it doesn't work for this reason. Yeah. And after we take, yeah, he eliminates the knight by force. But still, this is completely winning. So yeah, that was a nice game. I mean, he played well to survive as long as he did. <laughs> and... um Queen and king endgame under time pressure. No, he just pre-moved to try to cut the king off from going where it wants to go. You want to pre-move like close moves, moves that are only one square apart, generally. That's one thing you, you want to do. Well, generally, the uh, I, I did a ch chess.com series on the art of, uh, art of flagging, by the way. You can check all of my tips there. I have a chapter on pre-moving. But... The rook and pawn endgame was... I don't know if it was complex. I mean, after I take the other pawn... All I'm really trying to do here is set these pawns in motion. So c5, drive the king away, e3, d4. I'm just pushing the pawns. I mean, I can't push them here. e2, he just takes, d3, he takes this one. So we use the rook to supervise the progress of the pawns. Then we bring the king up. The only issue here is that amazingly, we can't push any of the pawns because we give up its neighbor. So we have to use the king and bring it to a good square so that it can... Uh, so that I can help the pawns move further. All right. Um, time for me to call it a day, guys. I'm pretty exhausted. All right, guys. Um, I'll see you guys later. Have a good start to the weekend. Take care and uh, goodbye for now. I'll see you guys later. Take care, everybody. And have a great start to the weekend. A great Friday. Bye.